When you're in love, the whole world is Jewish. I've had a lot of thrills in my life. Three kids, a gorgeous wife, such looks. I'm thrilled about my car, Riviera, my sister Sarah, and John O'Hara's books. But the thrill of thrills that gave my heart a clout was the thrilling night when I thrillingly found out. Steve McQueen is Jewish, would you believe it? He's just like you and I, couldn't you almost die? And Cary Grant is Jewish, could you conceive it? Such a living doll in a prayer shawl. Marlon Brando's Jewish, Pat O'Brien and Richard Conti. Not to mention that lovely couple, Harry and Bella Fonte. Frank Sinatra's Jewish, but you believe it? Sean Connery and Lyndon Johnson, too. As a matter of fact, the whole world is Jewish since I fell in love with you, Rosie McGonagall, since I fell. The hobby. Barney, I hope you don't mind my telling you, but good you don't look. <laughs> and good I don't feel. Well, if you want to feel good like me, you'll take up a hobby and relax. A hobby? You got a hobby? Sure, I got a hobby. <laughs> I collect bees. How do you collect bees? It's easy. I go out every day and I buy 500 bees. I get a gallon glass jar. I stuff the jar with the 500 bees. I close up the top of the jar. Then I put the jar on top of my desk and I sit and look at the bees. And that's my abby. <laughs> That's your hobby? You buy 500 bees, you put them in a glass jar, you close up the top? What do you do? You, you, you punch holes in the top so the bees can get air to breathe? No. <laughs> I don't punch holes in the top. Are you crazy? If you don't punch holes in the top, the bees will die. So let them die, it's only a hobby. <laughs> My husband, the monster. Sheldon, where are you? Sheldon, monster. <laughs> where are you, monster? Where am I? Downstairs, that's where I am. <laughs> The sun is coming up, and you got to go up and go to bed. Don't bug me, I'm locking up. <laughs> I don't know why I married that Yenta. <laughs> the last 846 years were thought of being torture. Children! Don't forget to put the cat out before you come to bed. All right, already. I'll put out the cat. Down, down, get back there. Down, get back. Get there. Ah, yes. Get back, back, back. Boy, some job. 
Sheldon! Sheldon! Did you put the cat out? In a minute, I just got your mother to bed! <laughs> He was short and fat and rode out of the west with a Mogan David on his silver vest. He was mean and nasty right clear through, which was kind of weird because he was yellow too. They called him Irving. Big Irving. Big short Irving. Big short fat Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the west. Irving. He came from the old bar mitzvah spread, schlepping a salami and pumpernickel bread. He always followed his mother's wishes, even on the range he used two sets of dishes. Irving. Big fat Irving. Big sissy Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. Irving. 141 could draw faster than he, but Irving was looking for 143. Walked in a saw saloon like a man insane and ordered three fingers of two cents plain. Irving. Big fat Irving. Big sport Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. Irving. The James boys was coming on a train at first son and the town said, Irving, we need your gun. Well, that train pulled in at the break of dawn. Irving's gun was there, but Irving was gone. Irving. Big fat Irving. Big help Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. Irving. Well, finally, Irving got three slugs in the belly. It was right outside the frontier deli. <laughs> he was sitting there, twirling his gun around, and Butterfingers Irving gunned himself down. <laughs> Irving. Big fat Irving. Big dum-dum Irving. Big dum-dum dead Irving. The 142nd fastest gun in the West. The shoe repair shop. What is it? <laughs> what could I do for you? This is going to sound just utterly ridiculous to you, but I'm moving, you see? And in an old coat in a trunk, I found this shoe repair ticket that must be seven or eight years old. It's for some shoes I brought in before I went into the Navy, and then I moved away from Brooklyn. And now I found this old ticket, and I know it sounds ridiculous that you would have the shoes after seven years, but I took a chance. Oh, I get it. You're that fella from Candid Camera. <laughs> no, 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 sir. Honestly, look, look, here's the ticket. Let me see it. Are you out of your mind? We haven't even used the numbers in years. Next! No, please, sir. <laughs> No, no, it was a long trip here from Baltimore. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but please, take a look in the back. All right, all right. I'll look. I'll be right back. This is very embarrassing. But after all, they don't make shoes like they used to. How can I be foolish enough to think that after seven years, that they would hey, still... Hey, mister from Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> yes? You're not going to believe it. You mean you found my shoes? Was it with half soles, leather heels, and metal tips? Yes, yes, that's right. 
It'll be ready Tuesday. <laughs> Divorce, kosher style. <laughs> Next case, Mrs. Esther Feldman. Coming, your highness. <laughs> what can this court do for you, Mrs. Feldman? I'll tell you what this court can do for me. It can give me a divorce for my Jaime. <laughs> a divorce? How old are you, Mrs. Feldman? I should live and be well, uh, but 10 days after next Hanukkah, I'll be 84. <laughs> Ken horror, Mrs. Feldman. <laughs> Tell me, how long have you been married? Fifty-eight years. Fifty-eight years and you want a divorce? Why? Why? Enough is enough. Voyage to the bottom of the sea. Well, Mr. Berkowitz, all I can tell you about the scuba equipment you have on is that you couldn't buy better stuff for love or money. I don't know about love, but it costs $2,000. Believe me, Mr. Berkowitz, this equipment will open up an unbelievable vista for you. There's a whole new world 200 feet down waiting for you. As Samuel Beckett said, to see the sea is to be the sea. Uh, this Mr. Beckett, did he spend $2,000 on equipment? Well, I guess I'll go. Goodbye and good luck. Well, here I am, sinking with my expensive equipment. <laughs> Hello, little fishy. Nice fishing. It's lovely down here. I must be a hundred feet down. It's getting dark. Now it's lonely. To tell the truth, I'm afraid. I must be crazy to spend two thousand dollars just to get scared. Berkowitz, a stiff upper lip. Don't be scared. Don't be a chicken of the sea. <laughs> well, how about that? I just hit bottom. Me, Berkowitz on the bottom of the sea, 200 feet down. And the two thousand dollars worth of equipment is working perfectly. And what's that coming this way? It's a man. And he's wearing nothing but swimming trunks. I'm here, two hundred feet down, the two thousand dollars worth of scuba equipment. And there's a man swimming next to me with only a pair of swimming trunks. Hey, mister, mister, how did you get down so far wearing just a pair of swimming trunks? Lederip, I'm drowning! <laughs> sailed across the ocean blue, he made his famous voyage with a Spanish-speaking crew. The shores of Puerto Rico were all that Chris could reach, but if his crew was Jewish, he'd have reached Miami Beach. Things might have been different, things might have been different. The 
Pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock and when their crops decreased, a friendly band of Indians took the pilgrims to a feast. If those were Jewish Indians, Thanksgiving we would eat. Potato luck is much bold and strictly kosher meat. Oh, but things might have been different. Things might have been different. The name of Peter Stuyvesant, we all remember still. He bought Manhattan Island for a $20 bill. If Peter had been Jewish for not one extra sou, he would have got Manhattan and the Bronx and Brooklyn. Oh, things might have been different. Things might have been different. At Valley Forge, the Continental Army nearly froze. They spent that awful winter with no food and frozen toes. If Washington was Jewish instead of Valley Forge, the army would have checked in up at Grossinger's with George. Well, things might have been different. Things might have been different. I wonder if the tale of Ponce de Leon is the truth. They say that he was searching for a fountain full of youth. If Leon had been Jewish, an ancestor of mine, he would have found a fountain full of Manischewitz wine. <laughs> A call from Greenwich Village. Hello. Hello, Mama. Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> My Shirley is calling on the telephone. She's calling her mother, who misses her very much, since Shirley doesn't call so often since she moved into her own apartment with a girlfriend named Beverly in Greenwich Village. And I haven't heard from her since yesterday afternoon. <laughs> It's my Shirley. Mama, how do you feel, Mama? How should I feel when I fixed up your room so nice with blue drapes you always wanted down to the floor? <laughs> and the velvet bedspread. So when you get tired of that way of life in Greenwich Village, your room will be here waiting for my Shirley. Listen, Mama, there's something you ought to know. And how should I feel when Dr. Kleinman told me just this morning in an emergency visit to the house that my varicose veins are popping out again? <laughs> and I'm not getting enough sleep. I haven't slept for six weeks since you've been gone, not to speak of my headaches and my palpitations. All of which Dr. Kleinman says is because I'm worried about you, my Shirley. Mama, you're not listening to me. I better just go ahead and tell you what I have to tell you. I met a boy. That's nice. And did you know that while I was up all night deathly sick <laughs> from worrying about you, I made a whole quarter crepe soup you love so much. <laughs> and went to the post office five o'clock this morning and mailed it strictly special delivery to <laughs> my Shirley. Mom, I met this boy last night. We ran away and got married. That's very nice. So I said to myself, what's the difference if I'm sick? But at least I had you for 32 years. <laughs> and it was wonderful, especially after your father left for bagels and locks one Sunday morning, seven years ago, and never came back. <laughs> Thank you for being my Shirley. That's not all mama. He doesn't have a job and his name is Michael O'Neill. Oh, <laughs> it's so nice that my Shirley called her mother today to say hello so I could hear the beautiful voice of my Shirley. Mom, I'm so happy that you're not the least bit upset. Why should I be upset? I have no reason to be upset. Cause the minute I hang up the phone, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> The Great Bank Robbery. Okay, Sally, let's go over the plans. You're going to the bank, and you'll tell them, stick them up. Should I take out the guns first? Should I take out the guns first? 
dummy! Certainly you take out the guns first. No, not here in the street. When you get to the bank, you take out the guns and you say, stick them up. Stick them up. Now, I, got I got it. When you got all of them stuck up, you'll take out the shopping bag from Corvettes. You'll give it to the teller and tell him to fill it up, please. You'll take the bag of money, you'll tell everybody that's stuck up that they shouldn't move for five minutes because you've got the place surrounded by me. You'll back out of the door, I'll be waiting for you in the car. That's it. And believe me, you got the easy job and I got the dangerous job. You got the dangerous job? I'm going in there alone with two guns against six guards and all those people, and I'm going to tell them to stick them up and fill it up and back out of the bank while you're sitting in the car, and you got the dangerous job? Certainly I got the dangerous job. I can drive. <laughs> Discussion in the airplane. Pardon me, lady, but ever since we took off, I've been meaning to ask you something. Oh, what is it, sir? What is that you're carrying in that blanket? What do you mean, what is it? It's my little baby. <laughs> lady, I hate to tell you, but <laughs> that is the ugliest, most ridiculous, <laughs> youth-looking baby I have ever seen. How dare you talk about my child that way? I've never been so insulted in my life. You are not getting away with this. I'll have you thrown off the plane. Look, lady, it's an ugly baby. Now, I've seen ugly in my time, but you've got an award winner. If I, if I could get my hands on you, I'd tear your hair out. I'm calling the captain. I'm going to give you Just such a second. <laughs> Just a second. Let's stop this argument. I'm the studious and this is... <laughs> this here is an Israeli Airlines flight. And I don't want anybody screaming in my cabin. Don't fight. Play nice. <laughs> Now, what seems here to be the trouble? Well, this smart aleck insulted me, and I won't stand for it. And I insist that something be done about it, or I'm going to sue him and the airlines. Lady, all I said was the truth. Oh, you rotten, no good, miserable... Just a second! <laughs> Calm down, lady. Take it easy. Just relax. I'll bring you a nice hot glass of tea. I'll fill it for your head, and I'll get you a banana for your monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Miami Beach. Simon, isn't Miami Beach absolutely beautiful this time of year? You said it. And here we are on this gorgeous beach in front of this beautiful hotel. Simon. You know what I was wondering? What? How many Jews do you suppose there are in the world? How many Jews in the world? <laughs> well, let me see. In the East, three and a half million. The South, another half million. Montana, Utah, and Wyoming, 40 or 50. <laughs> uh, Arizona, one, I'm sure of. <laughs> In the entire United States, maybe four and a half million. Europe, South America, Asia, Africa. Let me give you a total figure. I would estimate in the world today, five and a half million Jews. Five and a half million, huh? Then tell me this. How many Chinese in the world today? Chinese? Well, in the, uh, in the entire United States, at least a million. South America, Africa, the Philippines, a few more million. Formosa is loaded with them. <laughs> On the mainland, five, six hundred million. To give you a total figure in the world today, probably 800 million Chinese poisons. So, what you're saying is five and a half million Jews, 
800 million Chinese in the world today. Approximately. Now, tell me this. Look up the beach. I'm looking up the beach. Now, look down the beach. I'm looking down the beach. Do you see one Chinese... Stick. S-C-H-T-I-C-K. Stick. A bit. A piece of comedy business. An amusing happening. Plural. Stick luck. The panhandler. Pardon me, mister. Can you spare a dime for a glass of tea? I will not. You stopped me once before today. I gave you a dime for your glass of tea not 20 minutes ago. Mister, please stop living in the past. <laughs> Traveler. Sylvia, I understand you were on the continent. That's right. Did you get to Rome? Certainly. Well, what did you think of the Colosseum? All right, if you like modern. <laughs> the cemetery. I why did you die? <laughs> I why, why did you die? Why did oh, you pardon die? Me, pardon me, sir, but I've been watching you here at the grave for over a half hour. I guess the deceased was a close relative. No, I never met him. I why did you die? Why did you uh, die? I beg your pardon, sir. You say you never met him and you carry on like this. Then tell me, who is buried here? My wife's first husband. <laughs> I lie, did you die? I the kidnapping. What's this? <laughs> Through the window, a rock with a note on it. Here, let me see what it says. It says, Dear Mr. Shapiro, unless you deposit $10,000 in small bills in a paper bag under the old hollow tree in a vacant lot on the corner at midnight tomorrow, we will kidnap your wife. Sincerely yours, your kidnappers. <laughs> Boy, some tough cookies. I better write them an old back immediately. Let me see. Pencil, paper. Dear kidnappers, your rack of this date received. <laughs> I am writing to tell you I do not have $10,000. But please keep in touch. <laughs> Your proposition interests me. Bar Mitzvah. Sweetheart. What do you want? I'd like to discuss with you a spiritual adventure. Oh, your mother is coming to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, come on. It's 
time that we discuss plans for our son Joey's bar mitzvah. All right, we'll have a dinner with a three-piece band and my cousin Louis Bowen for five, six dollars a couple. We'll invite a couple of couples, but please, let's not make a big deal out of this. Certainly we would not make a big deal. <laughs> Particularly, not like the big deal your partner Sid is making uh, out of his Freddy's bar mitzvah. What is Sid doing behind my back? Oh, it's not so much really. It's taking the grand ballroom of the Esther. Fifty dollars a couple. Lawrence Wilkes Orchestra. <laughs> and just the immediate family. <laughs> Fifteen hundred couples. Aha! Uh -huh. How pushy can you get? Big man. Got a proof to the world he made money. Big production with him in his Esther ballroom with that Lawrence Velk in his noisy bubbles. Fifty dollars a couple. Shameful! We'll do it bigger! Yes. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get up our mitzvah consultant. <laughs> yes, Mr. Leibovitz, I, uh, I understand your problem. Now, what is your budget for this bar mitzvah? Pick a number. <laughs> oh, I see, one of those. All right. For $150,000, we can get the Radio City Music Hall for the evening. For the affair and show. I've seen that show. <laughs> All righty. For 200000 we can deliver the New York Hilton Hotel. 50 floors, each guest with their own suite. After dinner, 200 limousines will drive your party to the United Nations, where your son will make his bar mitzvah speech before the General Assembly. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> but uh, it's missing something. I got a feeling it's been done. Well, there's one other suggestion, but it's unbelievably expensive. Now you're talking. A thousand guests. You fly them all to Africa for a bar mitzvah safari. <laughs> Welcome to Africa, Mr. Leibowitz. We trust that you and your thousand guests will have a wonderful affair here. Let me introduce myself. I am known in these parts as Buana Finkelstein. <laughs> White Hunter. Listen, Buana. It's a nice jungle you have here. But we like it. Have you got everything I ordered? Oh, yes, sir. 250 elephants painted in your bar mitzvah color scheme. <laughs> Blue and white. 300 native bearers who will carry Leonard Bernstein in the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> we have arranged for the jungle dance tonight. We'll be doing the Watusi with 5,000 real Watusis. Lovely. Lovely. Everything I wanted for my Joey's bar mitzvah. That will show my partner with his crummy ass the ballroom. <laughs> When Leibowitz does something, it's an original. Now let's get on the way. Buana Gung Ho! Oh, Gunda, are we ready? Buana, Buana, Ungo, Wonga, Tunga! What is it? What's holding us up? Well, he says we'll be delayed a few minutes. Why? There are two other bar mitzvah safaris ahead of us. <laughs> Start 
to fall. The world is yours, not so bad. And everything's borrowed and blue, old and newish. Sort of glass of tea for two-ish. Cause the whole world is Jewish when you're in love. You just take your picture. It's a machaya. For the whole world is Jewish when you're in love.